So let's uh, just uh, make sure to cover the ground on everything. So, um, so this is the picture of atomic nucleus. So in chapter eight, uh, we weren't really concerned with atomic nucleus. We are just uh, um, dealing with the electrons around the atomic nucleus. The nucleus is whatever it is. Now we are not worried about the electrons at all. Instead, we are concerned with, well, what's at the core of the atomic, oops, so big, atomic nucleus. And this is, I don't know what it's supposed to be. Why did they have to draw so many? So, all right, I, let me count protons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Assuming there aren't any that's not visible, that must be oxygen and I can't. Uh, neon. <laughs> this must be neon nucleus, <laughs> maybe. Um, so you guys already know about protons and neutrons, right? Um, how are they similar? Wait, did I already talk about protons and neutrons? Oh, we haven't. All right. Um, so, okay, you guys know about electrons. You guys know about, so you, know, you do know about protons, right? From hydrogen atom. Proton was the thing that's uh, at the core of the hydrogen atom. So we can start uh, listing properties of proton and neutron separately. So properties of proton would be that um, um, it has charge. The charge of proton is plus 1e. The elementary charge or the same magnitude of charge as electron. Because that's how hydrogen atom is electrically neutral. And the mass of the proton from the mass of the hydrogen atom is approximately, mass of the proton is approximately 1,000 GeV per C squared. <laughs> that's the unit I have, the, have it memorized. 1,000 GeV, that's not right. It's about 1 GeV or 1,000 MeV. So let me just write it as 1 GeV per C squared. That's the mass of the proton. Um, all right, so that's proton. You know it exists because that's at the core of the hydrogen atom. Why, what do we need a neutron for? Like why would people, um, so, well, let me tell you one of the properties of neutron. You can kind of guess it from the name itself, neutron. So one of the properties of neutron is that it has charge of zero. Like why would you even, you know, why are you introducing something that has zero electrical charge? So it must be interacting with nothing. Like why are you even bringing it up? Hint for that is in the periodic table. Do, you, do people know the history of how periodic table was um, initially constructed? How was it initially constructed? Uh, by chemical property of elements? Not by chemical property. I mean, chemical property plays a role, but someone had a, an idea to order the element by one particular property. What was that one particular property? Well, they didn't know how to count the number of protons. They didn't even know about protons. <laughs> weight, atomic weight, yeah. They had a ways of determining atomic weight, so they um, listed it by, I think it's probably this one that'll work. So they did it by atomic weight, and once they started listing it by atomic weight, that's when they noticed the periodicity. So hydrogen kind of, well, it defines the baseline. Um, so hydrogen has atomic weight close to one. Um, it's not exactly one for because carbon-12 becomes the standard. You guys know that, right? Okay. Um, now, here's a funny thing. When you go to the next element, helium, your atomic weight doesn't go up to two. It goes up to four. <laughs> um, I, I, so if, it's, if you're counting number of protons, you went from one to two protons, why isn't the atomic weight two? Why is it four? So that's where people start thinking, okay, may, there must be something that's not quite like a proton, 
but maybe ways similar to proton. So let's just say mass of the neutron is also approximately 1 GeV over C squared. So what you are guessing is that with the helium, well, it must have two neutrons in it in addition to two protons. And let's keep, oops, let's keep going. Oh, wait, I don't want to scroll down that far. Okay, kind of jumps around. So when you look at, oh, you can't really read it. With the lithium, um, 6.9, so about close to seven. So on average, lithium must have three protons and four neutrons. All right, uh, my neutron numbers are increasing. Same thing with the beryllium, about um, four protons and five neutrons. And let's just keep going and see what happens. I want to just get up to carbon at least. Um, so boron, five neutrons, five or six, oh, sorry, five protons, five or six neutrons. Carbon, is carbon 13 also stable? Yeah. Okay. Um, so carbon-12 is where atomic mass unit is set. The definition of atomic mass unit is set so that carbon-12 is exactly 12 in atomic mass unit. Um, but when you look at the average, there's enough you know, carbon-13 out there in the world that the average comes up to 12.0. So carbon has six protons and six neutrons. Are you beginning to notice a pattern? kind of equal number of protons and neutrons, right? But it's not an absolute law. It's kind of a, we are at an odd place, but let's kind of, wait, let's kind of leave it there for now. So what we know or are guessing at now is that in the nucleus of the atom, you have two different types of particles because otherwise there's no explaining the pattern of the atomic weights you see. There must be a particle that has charge, and there must be a particle that has no charge. And the kind of pattern you see is, makes most sense if uh, you assume that these two masses are very similar. And this is where the I idea of isotope comes from. So the number of protons determines what element you are dealing with. So for example, helium has two different isotopes. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry, this doesn't actually illustrate it. Um, do I have any picture of a helium isotope down here? Oh, oh, There's okay. Like let's let's try that. It's all like, oh, wait. <laughs> oh, maybe. Oh, got it. Uh, I don't know if this is all that helpful. Yeah, it's not all that helpful. I'm just, I'm just gonna write. <laughs> um, so helium has, um, there are two stable isotopes of, of helium. So uh, let me use that to introduce some of the notation that I'm going to start using. Uh, so I guess this is kind of where we start. Um, Isotopes of element. So um, you guys have some sense of what ISO in a word means, right? Or ISO or ISOS. Like what? Equal, isosceles. Um, so when you start something with ISO, it means it, something is equal. <laughs> and What's equal? Oh, actually, I don't know what TOPS stands for. I don't think it stands for weight. Because I don't think, uh, all right, I'm just going to leave it there. So it has equal number of nucleons. It has, when you are referring to an isotope of a particular element, you are looking at the, um, you are looking at the particles which have the same number of protons and neutrons. This is what I mean. So elements are things like hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen is an element, and helium is another element. And what makes them distinct element is their distinct values of Z. 
So with the hydrogen, G is equal to 1. And what this really is is the number of protons. And with the helium, G is equal to 2. And this determines all the chemistry that occurs with these elements. Hydrogen having one proton in the center, that gives a particular energy levels for the electron that's around it, and um, that makes certain kind of chemical reactions happen, certain kinds not. Same thing with the helium, with the two protons in the center, the, to make it electrically neutral, you need the two electrons around it. They fit into particular orbitals that um, produces certain kind of energy levels. That's what determines all the chemistry that you, you see. So these are the chemical elements. But it turns out there's more than one type of um, particle that has one proton in it. So one proton in it. So those are isotopes. And the way I prefer to mark isotopes is this simple notation, because you can type it. Um, they are, um, you, you, you list them this way. The, sim, the name or symbol for the element, hydrogen, and you follow it with, uh, it, with its uh, isotope weight. So hydrogen 1 would be hydrogen, <laughs> something you already know. And there's, hydrogen has one more stable isotope that's not as common as hydrogen 1. It's a hydrogen 2, or it has its own name because it's simple enough to have its own name, deuterium. Anyone here have heard of heavy water? Like what makes heavy water heavy? Yeah, it has deuterium in place of hydrogen. So that's why it's heavier. <laughs> it has more neutrons. And hydrogen has one more um, unstable but long-lived, like 13-year half-life of isotope. That's the tritium, or hydrogen-3. And um, there are spectroscopic notations used. I don't really prefer them. I guess I should tell you what they are, if for nothing else to prove that I remember it. <laughs> so let's see if I actually remember it. So you have, you build it around your symbol, hydrogen. And if you write any number down here, this is your G value, right? And trying to remember which side it goes. I feel like your weight goes here. Like this would be the symbol for tritium. Is that right? It goes here? Yeah, maybe. All right, I don't remember. That's why I don't use it. <laughs> All right. So, um, but. Let's say I'll just never use it, because you need a superscript and all that, and it gets, uh, it gets annoying when this um, doesn't take a, uh, that much more space. <laughs> and this uh, has, so in the spectroscopic notation, um, like it for deuterium, this is a little bit redundant, because knowing that it's a hydrogen, you already know how many protons it has. The only thing you need to know is what is its isotope weight, then you know everything you need to know. So that, these are the isotopes of a hydrogen. And the two stable isotopes of a helium would be um, these. So you have helium, um, well, I'll, I'll go in the same order. Helium-3 is much less common. It's very rare. But you have a helium-3. And you have. Um, Helium-4, that's the most common version of helium. That's why the atomic weight you saw was mostly 4. There's not much 3 in there. And I don't think helium-5 is stable. Um, so, so yeah, yeah this, so that's what, when we talk about isotopes, that's what this refers to. So when you look at one element, helium, it has, um, so both helium-3 and helium-4, Chemically, they are near identical. The kind, any kind of reaction, helium-3 goes, helium-4 undergoes, which is not many. It's one of the noble gas uh, elements. So helium-3 is also a noble gas. Um, any kind of reaction you can have with, that's how you have heavy water. Because hydrogen forms bonds with oxygen, 
two hydrogens to one oxygen forms water. You do the same reaction with the deuterium, you get heavy water. So these different isotopes, they don't affect any of the chemical reactions most of the time, but they will affect the nuclear reaction. So for example, um, this uh, tritium, it can decay into helium-3 in a, well, I guess we were just talking about it, in a beta decay. But um, it wouldn't decay into helium-4 for reasons we'll go over in a little bit. Okay. So um, there's one kind of good fact for you to know. Um, so you guys notice the pattern of the atomic weight, right? As you are going higher up in the number of protons, you are seeing that the kind of uh, number of neutron was increasing to m catch up. But it's not really a hard and fast rule because with hydrogen, this is stable and that's the most common isotope of hydrogen. So obviously it doesn't need a neutron. And when you look at, well, I guess helium-4 actually does fit that pattern, two protons and two neutrons. But then you look at lithium, which has three protons and four neutrons, so what gives? So um, you don't have any clear pattern or like clear hard rule you can apply. So somebody just uh, plotted all of them. Um, this is a sort of a plot of um, stable atomic nuclei. So you can kind of see the pattern. So especially at the lower end, you see that the number of neutrons is often equal to the number of protons. If you have 10 um, elements with 10 protons, I guess that's neon, then you are kind of likely to have a stable isotope with 10 neutrons. So let's stop, double check. What's the atomic weight of neon? Neon has, ah, mm, I, sorry. I need to unselect that isotope. Properties? If, okay, I think that's the least annoying one. Um, so when you look at neon, yeah, atomic weight of neon is about 20. So 10 protons, 10 neutrons, approximately. Now, as you start to go into higher and higher Z value, or higher number of protons and neutrons, it starts to now skew in, the, in favor of neutrons. So when you get to very heavy, um, so uranium-238, I guess it's around the um, G value of 80, 90 or so, then for stability, you need, oh, well, uranium is not stable. So you need more neutrons than protons to keep it stable for some reason. And um, you can kind of see there's an illustration here. Let's look at lead. Lead, um, G value of 82. It has 82 protons. Atomic weight, average of 207, or on average it has 125 neutrons. So that one-to-one -one pattern starts to break up, and, and that's what you see here. And I guess intuitively this is how you would understand it. So, oh yeah, this is the more, I probably should have led with this. This is more beautiful diagram. Um, so, this is the figure that kind of gives you an intuitive sense. So one thing I have to tell you is that when you look at the atomic nucleus, something should tell you right away that this involves the forces that you haven't seen yet. Because what fundamental forces have you seen so far? Electricity, electricity and magnetism. And you also seen gravity, but it's so weak compared to electricity and magnetism, not worth mentioning. So when you look at this, based on electricity alone, it shouldn't hold together. Because all these protons are positively charged, they should repel each other. And neutrons don't do anything. But somehow, they are being held together. So what people assume was there must be another kind of unknown force, a nuclear force that's binding them together. And the easy assumption to make is that neutron is actually very similar to proton. Their masses are similar, their spin is exactly the same. The only difference is their charge. But you know, charge is electromagnetic. Maybe it doesn't matter to nuclear force. So you would assume that there's a, a second unknown kind of force between these particles, 
let's just say they are attractive. So whenever you have a neutron that's contributing to that attractive force. And two protons would also attract each other too, except there's an electrostatic repulsion, so the balance of it is that two protons would repel each other. That's why there's no stable version of helium-2. We do no neutron. There's not enough attractive nuclear force to hold it together. And um, with that kind of intuitive, rudimentary model, what you would guess is, well, the most place where this balance is, is held, as in the nucleus is not being crunched too much, or it's not, there's enough attractive force to keep it together, is usually the balance of where, um, balance of where the number of neutron and number of protons are the same, except as you go into higher Z value, as you go to higher G value, the long range repulsion of the, um, the electric force becomes more important. So you have to kind of keep piling on more neutrons to keep the whole thing more, keep the whole thing stable. So um, that's a sort of where we want to leave the nuclear forces with. Um, we probably won't go into much more than that. Um,